The Nick Scott Effect. The Nick Scott Effect. Everywhere podcasts are found. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by my friends at the Appalachian Outpost. They're located near Logan, West Virginia. If you haven't been over here on the East Coast in a while, you probably don't know that the off-road side-by-side industry has been the craze for about the last five, six years. It's really boomed when COVID uh, came and you couldn't go out of the house while people got in their uh, razors and their side-by-sides and their Jeeps, and they went out in the woods. So it's really boomed here where I'm at in West Virginia, and my friends at the Appalachian Outpost cater specifically to the off-road industry. So we have this trail system that goes throughout West Virginia called the Hatfield-McCoy Trail System. There's a trailhead into one of those trails right at the resort, right at the Appalachian Outpost. So you could haul your side-by-side, you could haul your off-road vehicle, your, what do you call it, ATV, uh, or there's another UTV. That's what I'm thinking of. You could haul that down there. You could ride all day long and come back to your own cabin, your own cabin, not a hotel room, your own cabin that are beautiful, feel just like home. And they got you covered with food. The Broken Axle is right on site. It's a bar and grill, delicious food, amazing drinks, great atmosphere. So plan your next off-road trip with your buddies at the AppalachianOutpost.com. Get out in the woods, get muddy, have some fun at the Appalachian Outpost. This episode is sponsored by my friends at Tops Off Barbershop. I've been getting my hair cut at Tops Off Barbershop for almost 10 years now. Maybe it may have been right at 10 years now. Um, they're located on Hale Street in downtown Charleston, West Virginia. And uh, it, it's a beautiful story. My friend Scott, uh, I believe he was working in the restaurant indus- industry and wanted to become a barber. So he went to barber school. He met his fiance in barber school. She was going to beauty school, which the two schools were together. And they founded Tops Off Barbershop right there on Hale Street. And Scott became a dear, dear friend of mine. And unfortunately, in 2020, we lost Scott. But his memory and his hard work continues on with his fiance, Kelly. She still has Tops Off going strong. They're doing amazing, amazing things at Tops Off Barbershop. So if you're in the Charleston, Huntington, Ripley, Logan area, I know we have listeners there, and you want a good, fresh, clean up, good haircut, head to Tops Off Barbershop, uh, Barbershop on Hale Street. They also have some really cool merch. This is the new sweater they hooked me up with, the Skull and Roses logo. I love it. And you can grab one of these at Tops Off as well. So check out Tops Off Barbershop, Hale Street in Charleston. I've never encountered that question before. <laughs> we'll we'll fi- find out. We'll find out. Hey, Brian, thank you so much for doing this. I- I'm sure you sure. hear this a lot, but I have been a fan of yours and your band for decades. And when I say that, I'm dating myself as well. <laughs> so, Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. And, and I-, I said this on the air a lot uh, when we would introduce your song uh, for Airplay. Uh, that I always found it ironic that I was a freshman in high school in 1996 when the freshman was number one everywhere. Uh, right. And I've always found that funny. I know it's silly, but I've always found that ironically funny. No, I get that a lot though. That that's not. Uh, yeah, you're you're no anomaly there. Uh, I hear that from a lot of different people, which is funny. I I think probably some of it is some people are bullshitting, but. You know, it's a story to tell. It is a story to tell. And I graduated in 2001. So, uh, so yours checks out. Yep, it does. <laughs> but but I remember when I decided, so I, I learned to play drums in my dad's church. My dad was a minister. And then I learned to play guitar. And then I was actually in a band for a while. And we kind of just puttered around. But I've always loved music. I've always had the gift to talk your ear off. So I went into radio in the DJ world and kind of left the music behind. But when I went into radio, you guys were everywhere, especially early in my career. And uh, finally, to get the opportunity to talk to you is kind of a full circle moment for me. So I'm I'm so grateful you came on. Thanks for having me. So 1992 is when you guys started the band. That is some serious longevity in the music industry. That's incredible. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, in all fairness, it's not all of the original members. My brother and I, Brad and I, formed the band 
So Brad and I are still in the band and the original keyboard player. But, you know, since then, we've picked up a new guitarist and a new drummer. And, you know, part of the reason for the longevity is that um, that the old band, we had gone through so much turmoil in the beginning trying to get signed and it was so much pressure and then the freshman came out and then there was so much pressure to you know follow it up with hits after hit after hit uh that all of those bad memories uh were getting in the way of just us just having fun in the studio again and so you know we went into the studio and made a couple of kids records just for fun and during that process some of the guys didn't want to make kids records even though i did and uh and so what I'm saying is over the course of the 30 years, it's not, it hasn't been the same people. It hasn't been the same attitude. Like everybody now that has been in the band for the last 15 years with us has been amazing. Mm-hmm. And we have a blast on the road. We have a blast in the studio. That's what we're up here. We're up here in, a, in, a, in an isolated cabin in the middle of Northern Michigan. Uh, and there's a nice studio up here and we're, you know, we're living together for the next week. I can never do that with the old band without somebody <laughs> getting a nose broken. You know? So, so uh, I, I'm assuming, are you guys recording a new record? We are. Yeah. Everybody just brought their songs in. And this is the first step in the pre-production where we just sit around and we listen to everybody's songs and we all kind of play on them a little bit, kind of figure out what we want to do, how we want to attack the song. And we have a producer up here with us. So yeah, this is the first step for a new album. So 30 years together. So many great songs. I love Photograph. I love The Freshman. Goes on Thank and on. This far into the game, and you guys have what, nine albums now? Eight albums? Nine, nine. I think that, I'm not sure those include the kids' records, but we'll say nine, yeah. So, nine records, all these wonderful yeah. songs. What is your approach to writing now at this stage in your career? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, for me, you have to get into a certain space and lock yourself up and you're going to write some, I'm going to write some really shitty songs that first couple of days. I mean, honestly, they're terrible, but as the, as the time progresses, uh, ideas come stories that people have told me at house concerts that I've played and everything that those stories come up, um, you know, just being together with the band now in this situation, you know, I've got all the lyrics to write and, uh, the process hasn't changed much for me over the years. Once I figure out, figured out how to do it, uh, to create a song that, that I think stays at the bar where we are musically and where we have been musically, uh, that's the most important thing. And I think that because of my process has been the same over the years, that it's stayed pretty much the same. Now, this is not the hit song making progress. Uh, that's something that we kind of stumbled on with, you know, Photograph was a timely piece for that time. And it was a nice hit for us and, and Freshman, of course. And then Colorful came out mm-hmm. with the movie Rockstar. And that that was a bit of a hit for us, too. So that's all nice. We're more in the process now of just writing what we enjoy listening to because the, the radio thing's a whole different game now. Oh, you yeah. know, there's no point, you know. I mean, something that we write that could be quirky and silly and funny can will be a TikTok smash, you know, and then next thing you know, that's a hit song. So it's a whole different game. So now we just decided to write for ourselves and doing that is very freeing. uh, And that now has become part of the process. So that's amazing. And it's, uh, I'm glad to hear you mention the radio thing. So I got my start in radio, Um, Mm -hmm. but I left radio kind of like I hear artists like you talking about leaving radio because they started cutting the personalities out. Um, sure. the last radio station I worked at, I talked twice an hour over what we call a song intro. So imagine at the beginning of freshman to the point where you sing, we had that yeah. much time to talk and that's it. So right. it's, it took yeah. all the personality out. And that's when I was like, I'm out, I'm going to go do yeah. Sirius XM and other stuff. But, um, now I have a lot of artists, a friend of mine, Kate boy tech, she's an up and coming country artist. They're doing singles. And they're just firing off singles, not even full records anymore. Right. We did that for our last three albums where we release a single every two weeks, maybe every three weeks. And then by the end of the year, we have an album of songs that it's already been released. And then we'll go press some vinyl Mm. and sell the vinyl at our shows. That's, that's the way we do it as well. That's the most cost efficient uh way and also the best way to k- 
keep yourselves in people's faces more. Uh, you know, new single coming out every two weeks, every three weeks, people suddenly you're all over social media because of it. And you're all over social media at least once a month. And so that that whole process, that whole uh, uh, strategy works very well. Did you to- have any idea that when you wrote The Freshman, whether it be the, the guitar lick or yeah. the lyrics, did you have any clue that it was going to be as big as, as it got? Not in the beginning until I played it live. In the beginning, it was just this little story song. I thought... You know, it was more in the vein of Harry Chapin or James Taylor, these mm-hmm. other, you know, old guys that I learned how to play guitar, acoustic guitar, because I finger picked it. Nobody was finger picking back then in the ni- early 90s, you know. Everybody was, uh, you know, pretty hardcore strumming. Uh, and so I didn't think so until I played it live. And I played it live and I fucked up all the words <laughs> because I didn't know it well enough to play it, you know. I mean, I wanted to play. I'm so anxious to try this new song. And the band got done playing. I played it by myself, but I had the part. I had the part about she was touching her face. I had, you know, uh, you know, uh, can't be held responsible. She was touching her face. What I was saying that part correctly and saying the chorus correctly, but the verses I fucked up. But afterwards, I had a ton of people come up, and they just said, "Oh my God, what's that song about her touching her face? Who song is that?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's my song. Oh, this might be something." <laughs> And then the next time we played it, people were there and they were singing along already. The second oh. time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, and then, you know, playing it for two years in the in the uh, uh, in the college scenes in Michigan, you'd hear it coming out of a dorm room window. You know, our first recording of it, and then I knew, you know, me on the walk of shame. Uh, the next, on, on a morning, <laughs> you know, at noon with my leather pants on and my shirt off, walking through uh, the campus of Michigan State and hearing it come out of the one of the dormer windows, I'm like, I've totally made it. I've made it. You know, that's great. Somebody stole my shirt and the whole thing and everything it was ridiculous. But I do remember that very well. So you know what? So is- yeah, I kind of had some idea, but I had the idea because the people like. Absolutely. You know, one thing I've always tried to do as like an interviewer is I hate answering, asking the same songs that an artist like, or answering the same questions that an artist like you probably has heard ad nauseum over the years. Yeah. But what was the inspiration behind the freshman? I got to say, the story was partly made up. I, I had been dating someone and then we broke up and then my buddy, wasn't really my buddy. I mean, we were close enough, but I knew him, but he started dating her and then they broke up and I dated her or whatever. She got pregnant. We didn't know really who the father was right between the two of us. And she decided to, uh, have an abortion. Oh. So, you know, you don't know what your participation is. I mean, the reality of what your participation is, I guess we're both responsible, you know, but back then you'd go, I can't be held responsible, you know? I mean, it's like yeah. he was, you know, and I was. In the song, in the narrative, she commits suicide. She did not do that. But these are little poetic license things to make it a little more sure. dramatic is why I did that. Sure. But, you know, so the inspiration was just a, a real-life story that went uh, went one step further, I guess. So. Does that, has that bothered you over the years that that could have been your child? No, I think... I think initially, um, yeah, but I think, you know, I, since I've had four kids and, you know, you kind of move on like anybody else would. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pro-choice person. So, you know, if I was pro-life, I'd be, it'd be a little bit different, but for me, it was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't really an issue. You know, I felt more bad for her. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how the, uh, the, how the other guy felt. You know, I haven't talked, I hadn't talked to him. So you never followed up, <laughs> never really followed up. Even after the song, even she didn't come to me after the song, you know? So neither, neither she, one of them, she, does she know it was about her? I don't even know. I frankly, I don't even know. Wow. I mean, I don't know how you could not. It's still kind of ambiguous. There are lines in there. Like she was touching her face that don't have anything to do with anything right. other than I was writing the song. And MTV was on in the corner and the volume was down. And 
And it was the video for the divinals. I touched myself and she was doing that. I'm like, oh, that's cool. All right, I'll put that in here. What the hell? <laughs> you know. But that's kind of the way songwriting works. You know, you try to find a phrase that's catchy, that'll fit. And uh and so it's enough ambiguity in the song, I think, that maybe she never did. I don't know. How crazy would that be to live your life for the last 30 years and here's this ultra, ultra smash hit record that right. was about you and you have no idea. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? I just assume keep it that way, frankly, Nick. <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> Absolutely. Your secret is safe right here with me. Thank you. I'm not going to name any names. No. Because- you know, and when you first came on, because I'm such a fan, when you first came on, I almost wanted to say, hey, Ricky Bell, how are you? Ah, oh, nice. I'll take it. You know Dude, uh, what? A great movie. So fun. Jeff Pilson from Doc and taught me how to play bass. I get to go over to his house in LA and sit with him. And uh, he taught me how to play that bass, man. He was so great. He was such a, such a great guy. And then uh, I don't know. Was he? Oh yeah. He was in the movie too. Mm-hmm. And, yes. uh, and uh, Blas Elias from Slaughter was in there. Zach Wild. It was great. That's a fun movie, man. Do you keep up such with any of those guys? Movie. Yeah, of course. I mean, Tim Oliphant and I have been friends for years. You know, um, he played the the guitarist in the um, in the Blood Pollution band with me. Uh, Zach Wild, I'd see on occasion. You know, he always gave me so much shit. I, I loved it, but every time I walk in a room, he's like, "Oh, here comes the freshman." You know, some shit. <laughs> It's my daughter is walking by my studio. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. But I'm, uh, yeah, I would love to see a blood pollution reunion. Oh, my God. It'd be so fun. It'd be oh so my fun. God. I would fly across the country to go to that show. But you want the original. you want the original singer from Blood Pollution. You don't want Stephen Jenkins from Third Eye Blind. No. <laughs> He's the one that took over for Mark Wahlberg in the movie. Now, uh, do you, because yeah. Third Eye Blind and the Verve Pipe right there in the mid 90s and late 90s, you guys kind of came up and were really, really red hot around the same time frame in yeah. the 90s. Do you keep in touch with those guys or? Uh, not with Steven. I mean, Steven and I kept in touch quite a bit for the promotion of the movie. And then after that, we've kind of just went our own ways, you know. Sure. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm still in touch with a lot in the 90s. Guys, I mean, we toured with Tonic for years. Oh yeah, told the Wet Sprocket. We're all friends. I mean, uh, you know, all those guys. You know, um, so it's it is nice to see them when we go on the road and stuff. But um, but and I know Third Eye Blind's going back on the road too. I mean, I'm sure we'll see them along the way somewhere. What a great show! Third Eye Blind and the Verve Pipe on the same bill. I mean, I love that. I love that idea. I'd love to open up for them. I mean, I would. I, that's my jam. I like to open up, by the way. I like to go on for a half hour, 45 minutes and hit them and quit them and then watch the other band. <laughs> that's like the best gig ever. I like, love we just it. Took a, we just took a gig with Soul Asylum and I'm like, oh, yeah. yes, that's going to be amazing. We get to play 45 minutes and we get to watch, so, you know, get to watch, uh, what, what did I just say? Oh, uh, Soul, Soul Asylum. Soul Asylum. Thank you. Yeah, I yeah, went on your website great. and and I looked at your tour dates. Looks like you guys got some great shows. Now, I'm located <laughs> in West Virginia. I'm originally from Cincinnati, but I'm located in West Virginia right. and I I travel everywhere. And uh I believe you guys played live on the levee in Charleston, West Virginia a couple years ago. Does that sound we familiar? Did. Amazing. Yeah. That was great. That mm-hmm. whole that whole uh program is awesome. Oh yeah. I mean, that was one of our that was one of my favorite shows of that year. I remember it was hot. Oh yeah, but I do remember the setup was great. The people were awesome, and we had a blast. You know, so live on the levee has been going on for several years now. Of course, when COVID happened, it kind of went away a little bit. But uh, right. man, I love to see you back in the area. Uh, and you're right, the people here, being a Cincinnati, and I moved here to follow radio. Met my wife; she's a West Virginian, and decided to put down roots and start my kind of broadcast business here uh, because of the people. Good for you. The people yeah. are amazing, you know, and it's, sometimes West Virginia gets a bad rap and I've never understood that. I don't understand that either. Of course, now the time, the places that I've been, um, it's Charleston, right? Um, That's where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great, great city. Mm-hmm. I mean, usually just passing through Charleston is what happens with us, you know? So I don't know much more about it other than it's a beautiful state. You know, but Michigan's a Michigan, Michigan's a beautiful state too. But most people think of Detroit. You know, it's like it's well, nuts. Safe. When we get off the air here and, and wrap up in a little bit, I'll give you my my personal number. And next time cool. you're rolling through Charleston, man, lunch or dinner on me. Hundred um, percent. 
We'll uh, take advantage of you. Thank you. <laughs> but so when I was three, four years old, my dad took a job because he was a chef his whole life. When I might okay. be a little jaded, but one of the best chefs in the world. And huh? uh, he took a job in Ypsilanti, Michigan, right outside of oh, Detroit. Yeah. So yeah. I lived there for about two years when I was a kid. I just wrote a song. I want to say it won't be on this. It might be on a solo record, but it's called The Queen of Ypsilanti. So there you go. I'll have to show that to him. So we went yeah. up there for a couple of years, and then uh, he had another opportunity to come back to, to Southern Ohio, and that was that. I, I have some vague memories of Ypsilanti, not a lot, uh, but I always find it funny because some uh, uh, of the folks that I worked with in radio were from Michigan, and me being from Ohio, of course, it was always a, a source of contention between <laughs> us. Of course. Of course. <laughs> are you, now, are you a Wolverine fan, or... Uh, no, I'm, we're, we're all state fans. I mean, we're, we're a Spartans. Michigan state band. Yeah. We, we, I mean, I live, I didn't go to state. I lived on near the campus because the band was from there and everybody else went to college and I just hung out and partied with everybody, <laughs> but we're definitely, uh, I'm definitely a state fan all the way across the board. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to, to talk to you about that I, and this is what gave me the idea to reach out to you and your management to have you on the podcast because one day we're laying in bed, getting ready to end the night, you know, crash out. I'm scrolling through TikTok and I see videos of you. I, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, anonymously going into karaoke bars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not fun. Super <laughs> singing fun. the freshman and the people have no idea what's so going on. And you play into that and I'm on the floor howling, laughing. Like, how do they love not it. know that's Brian Vander Ark up there? I love it. And I do it, and the only, and since then, I started doing that about a year ago. And uh, since then, people are asking me, come on, come come to my karaoke, come to my town. It's like, I'll never go and do it announced, first of oh, all. Sure. I mean, I have to be, I have a person with me, usually a friend with me, they'll, they'll take video of me doing it. But the more dead the bar is, the better. <laughs> and if the DJ doesn't know, it's amazing because they always go, let's make a little noise for Brian, everybody. Yeah. You know, and then there's a smattering of applause, you know, polite applause. And then you'll hear comments like, he tries too hard to sound like the original guy. <laughs> I love that shit so much, man. I love it. I love it so much. And Have I'll never go and do it and let people know. I mean, if somebody recognized me, I don't think I would do it then, you know, it's just not any fun then. Have you ever gone off stage and someone's like, man, you sound just like him. Oh, yeah, have a lot of people come up and congratulate me. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Tell me I should be in a band, that kind of thing. I just play it up. It's super fun. So, so have you ever actually said, hey, that that's that's actually me? No, I would never do that. Never did it? Okay. No, it's no fun. That's no well, fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, unless you unless I'm poor and I want drinks bought for me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I might do it or I want to get laid or something. Or there maybe. you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but what, uh, no, I would never do that. What blows my mind is, is I guess I'm a music nerd, right? So I know who you yeah. are. And if I was that karaoke DJ and you walked up to me, I'd be like, bro, you know? Yeah, you the know fact that the know. DJ doesn't know blows my yeah. mind. Well, a lot of times the best way to do it actually is have somebody else put your name up there too. You know? Oh, just yeah, to make yeah. sure I do. Listen, man, I do all this. I'm very careful because it's no fun. If I get up there and people recognize me that the most important thing is for me to get a Like to, if something makes me laugh, that's all that matters to me. I just, it just cracks me up. I love oh, dude, that. I, I will just know it works because the first <laughs> several of those I watched, I was on the floor laughing. I, 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 it, I mean, it was great. Um, so switch gears back to, and normally I like to have guests on for an hour, but I won't keep you on for that long. So whenever you need to wrap up and go, we can cut her down. It's no big deal. Um, switch gears back to your new music. That's what I'm ex very excited about. When do you think we could see the new Verve Pipe record available? Oh, definitely within, I think, I think singles will start cranking out the next couple of months, next three months. Yeah, for sure. Do you have a, a mean, name for the album? No, nothing yet. Like today was the first time we heard a couple of the songs the other guys wrote and we're working on those. So n like literally we've got 25 songs to get through and then to, you know, to figure out what the album is. Our mm -hmm. last album threads was a little bit of different process, but I mean, honestly, I, and every every band will say this, I'm sure, but I, I feel really confident about 
the musicality in this band and what we try to do and how I said before that I feel like we've really raised the bar. And if things don't meet the bar, they don't make it on the record. Um, and so our records, I, I have... I don't think people will be disappointed in the next record too, because there's some great stuff on here. Great songs. I can't wait to hear it. So, so you all bring songs. So say you have 10 you've written and your brother has sure. five and yeah, your yeah. keyboardist has 10 and you yep. guys go, okay, that one sounds great. That one's terrible. <laughs> and then, you yeah, essentially, but you know, honestly, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty democratic process at that point. It's like, we're going to try everything, give everybody a chance, and maybe I can make your song better or more appealing to me. And so let's work on this song and try to get it there until finally the writer goes, okay, this isn't working. Even my songs, you know, we, the last album we made with RCA was called Underneath. That's the one that had Never Let You Down and Colorful from the movie Rockstar and all those. I had a whole, I had like a, another 10 songs that did not make the record. And so I ended up making a solo record right after it. So I've always got that option to do that. I want everybody to like enjoy the process and have fun with it. And I feel like I can help make other songs better. You know, Absolutely. I can help my brother out with this. I can help Channing out with this or Randy out with this and make it sound more like us, you know, because Randy comes from a place you know, where he's more Randy Newman-esque, you know, he's the piano player and it's like, you know, let's rein that back, you know, pull the reins on that one and let's figure out how we can make this a little more uh, alternative, you know? And mm -hmm. so these are challenges, but, uh, but it's all part of the process and I love the process. I'm so excited to be up here. I'm also excited because I got a whole new batch of gummies and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to try them. <laughs> I'm ready to try them as soon as we hang up, Nick. <laughs> That's awesome. So, and, and you also, uh, uh, in addition to your musical talent, you've acted a lot. You were in Roadkill and several other things. So yeah. are you doing any acting currently or do you have anything slated? It's funny that you say you've done some acting and then you mentioned a movie. You, it wasn't like you said, you know, you were in The Godfather. <laughs> it's like, you know, you were in Roadkill. <laughs> I love like, that movie. It was a great I, movie. Listen, I love the movie too, but it's so funny because... If you did it, you didn't do anything wrong, Nick, believe me. <laughs> the point is, is that when you say, oh, you've done a lot of acting, you were in Roadkill, it's like not the movie that anybody would ever in a million years. Well, you got me. Rockstar, Roadkill, uh, <laughs> okay, great right. movies, House of the Rising Sun. That was a great movie. I did that with Dave Bautista. Who knew Dave Bautista was going to become this huge star? That was his first movie. I did it with him. That was so fun. Uh, anyway, no. Uh, he didn't power bomb you, did he? And he didn't know. I, I begged him. I begged him to. Did you really? <laughs> Again, for the laugh, man. Video it. Have him beat me up just so I can crack up. I'll be in traction, but it'll crack me up. Yeah. Uh, no, but no, my my friends make movies and I go and I'm in their movies. And that that's the kind of thing that I'm doing now. I'm not really actively searching for acting gigs. This is my love, you know, doing this. Absolutely. So. For sure. I, I, I wish there would be a way to make, and I guess it goes back to me being a music nerd and I could play guitar and stuff too. And I'm a fan of rock and alternative music. Uh, I wish there was a way to make a rock star too. I wish there w yeah. was a storyline or something and have you guys back in it. Man, that so would be fun. incredible. We'd all be doing house concerts probably like everybody else that's you know done with it. You know, it's funny in that movie, Actually, a scene got cut where we were, it's like what happened in the future. And and the guys from Blood Pollution were all uh, in a disco band on a cruise ship. So maybe there's a movie there. Could be, yeah. Maybe there's a movie there. Let me think about that. So did you ever stay in contact with Mark Wahlberg or were you guys kind of separated through that no, process? No, everybody kind, of, everybody kind of went on their own. I mean, guys yeah. like, you know, Wahlberg go, immediately goes to, you know, 10 more movies, you know, I think he went from that to the departed. I mean, it's just like, oh, wow, okay, that's yeah. like the stratosphere of acting. That's yeah. a, such a great movie. Uh, but the other guys, no, we, you know, I see him on the road, the musicians and stuff. And like I said, Tim's been a friend of mine for some time. He's, he's got a great career. I don't know if you know him at all, but you know, he was in justified and he's, mm -hmm. I mean, he's in so many things. He's a great actor. So, uh, you know, you kind of like, can't really be friends with them because of the fame. But for instance, I just, I was just able to, I've been friends with Jeff Daniels for quite some time. He's also a musician. I don't know if you know that he's a great, great guitarist, super fun. We made an album together and uh, I just got to spend a few days watching him uh, shoot in Pittsburgh uh, 
this American Rust show, which was awesome. Mm-hmm. It's a great show. Oh yeah. Uh, so I can stay with them, and we got to jam. We jam every night and just hang out. And it was. I mean, that's really nice when you have people that are like minded. You know, he's from Michigan as well. So Mark Wahlberg's like in a whole different, like a whole. You know, grew up different than I did. You know what I mean? It's like after a while, you're like, you know, really anything that much to talk about other than your shared experiences. But I could talk to guys like Jeff Daniels all day because he grew up in Michigan. His dad worked at a lumber mill. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? He knows exactly who I am and who he is. So that, that's, that's how you make, just like any other thing, you make friends that way. You know? So through your whole career and all of your success, have you always stayed in Michigan or did you venture out no, to LA? I, I stayed. I did live in LA for a little over a year. I lived in New York for a year, but you know, Michigan's always been my home. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I always felt like whenever I left Michigan, I was leaving home, mm-hmm. even though I lived in LA, <clears throat> you know? So I decided when I got married that, uh, and you know, we were going to have kids. I'm like, well, let's go live in Michigan. And my, you know, my wife, the time was like, she had no concept of what Michigan was. She's from California. <laughs> and so she ended up moving here for 17 years and had kids with me for 17 years. I was like, good for her. Welcome to the culture shock. <laughs> Welcome to the culture shock is right. <laughs> well, that was kind I mean, of look me- around here. I mean, look at this shit. It's like, nice. Just, we just had, you know, a foot of snow a couple of days ago. It's like, uh, well, my wife and I, we've talked about when, when retirement age comes for us, hopefully way down the road, uh, somewhere warmer, just so we don't have to deal with that crap. Snow yeah, and so exactly forth. Right. In the winter. You know I know it's so it's too easy to slip and break a hip at my age around here. <laughs> at your age you're only like a few years older than me you're making me feel old yeah i doubt it. i'm not gonna get into age but no yeah. we won't now you mentioned being pro-choice and yeah. I, I always like to ask folks because every celebrity every actor every musician has a different take to politics sure. in their craft are you yeah. the type that is open to talk politics or are you the type that thinks hey i'm a musician i'm just going to entertain you with music no i've been very vocal about my uh liberal stance and i've supported liberal candidates in michigan the democratic candidates and i'm a big fan of our governor i won't get into an argument (laughs) there's you're never going to change anybody's mind so i Mm. i've realized there's no point and i try to keep it off social media as much as possible for that reason too uh just because i don't want to go back and forth with people it makes everybody feel bad it's like what's the point so uh and it looks bad you know you have a whole bad. thread of hundreds of comments that are just nasty and, and like, arguing. it's not worth it it's just not worth it so what i do is i lend my support when i can i go on the campaign trail if i can i, I do these kinds of things i've written songs for campaigns before i mean you know i do all <laughs> of this stuff whatever i can do because honestly like michigan's in that weird place you've got the michigan militia you've got the 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 governor who was almost kidnapped you know it's like and then you've got some really liberal great people that are trying to do good things you've also got some republicans who are trying to do great things as well people just love the state but then you've got the extremes on both sides and that's what i can't deal with the extremes i like people right in the middle most of my friends actually are republican it's pretty funny it's uh, well, I, and I was going to ask you about how, how wild it was that the Michigan governor was almost kidnapped. I mean, how does that yeah. happen? I mean, I honestly don't think that the nation really realizes how close that was to happening. I mean, it was going to happen. These guys, at least these guys were going to try. And what know? were they going to do? Just like ransom? Hold? I mean, he was like, I remember I just read uh, the guy that wasn't from here that was driving, go you know, casing out her house every day or moved up here just to like check things out, check her patterns and everything. I was like, that's some serious shit. That's but what, yeah. thank God. I mean, nobody needs that. I don't care which side you're <laughs> on. Good Lord. So on Tuesday, I had a delegate who's in our local Congress, a West Virginia delegate by the name of yeah. Doug Scaffon. He does a lot of great stuff for the uh, state. And we had this same conversation. And uh, just to give you a short little snippet, you know, in, in 2008, I voted for Obama and, mm-hmm. and had a lot of liberal ideals. Yeah. And in 2010, the radio cluster that I worked for, we flipped a rock station. Well, they flipped a rock station to right. a conservative talker, like all oh, Sean yeah. Hannity, Glenn Beck. All day, every day. Yeah. Well, when I would get off the air, off of my Top 40 station that I worked on, I didn't want to listen to Top 40 radio anymore. I've been on the air for six hours. So right. I, I love talk format, talk radio. That's why I love doing podcasts. Sure. Sure. 
Sure. And uh, so I would turn that on. One, interested in this new station we have. And sure. two, see what they have to say. Yeah. There is a very real thing about being indoctrinated. Because yeah. in the two years that I listened to that radio station, I went from a middle-of-the-road, centralized kind of libertarian kind of guy. I don't like extremes on either side, like you said. I have right. friends that are Democrats and liberals. I have friends that are Republicans and conservatives. I'm somewhere in the middle. And by 2012, when uh, Obama ran the second time, I became extreme right. And it was wow. all I did. And, and I know that now. And it was all because every day for like two hours a day, I'm taking this sure. shit in. You sure. know, all this conspiracy and all this hatred and all this blah, blah, yeah. blah. And, and I, I remember one day I took a step back and I'm like, what am I doing? I never used to talk like this. I never mm -hmm. used to sound ignorant like this. I never right. used to be uh, whatever. And I stopped all that. And, yeah. and I don't even, I don't, I don't check Fox news. I don't take check CNN when Trump right. was in office and they were fighting with CNN and everything. I just kind of was like, Hey, I'm gonna go over here and get my news over here. And, right. and I've got back to that center lane. I always jokingly tell folks, if you want to know about Nick Scott's politics. I want to see my gay friends get married, smoking pot, shooting machine guns. That's my, that's my <laughs> yeah, politics. That's good. <laughs> you Dude, know? Why is that not a t-shirt yet? Nick? Come on. <laughs> Put it in your song. You have my permission. I um, love it. I love it. But, I know what you mean, though. There was a documentary film that I don't think it ever came out, but the, I, I saw trailers for it, or maybe it did. I forget the name of it, but it was a it was a woman who was very liberal. Her dad was very liberal. She was brought up liberal, and then he took he lost his job and took another job that was a two hour drive, and he would listen to talk radio on the way there. And though she documented his attitude, like changing and becoming more and more extreme. So I know there's something to it. Just like I feel like, you know, it could probably go the opposite way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just ne doesn't necessarily have to go to the conservative way and the extreme conservative uh, uh, But, you know, I think people in general, if they just look at that as entertainment and go, all right, I mean, I can watch it. I can yeah. watch Sean Hannity and laugh and just say, oh, my God, this guy, look at him go for this. Look at him go for this or whatever. Yeah. I don't get yeah. angry at him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Tucker and Carlson, especially another guy. Like I used to like him. At, I think it was point, point or not point counterpoint or whatever it was. The uh, crossfire or whatever I think it was. Crossfire. Or, yeah. Yes. When mm -hmm. he was on, when John Stewart got on there and, and you know, raised hell on, on those guys. <laughs> but I enjoyed him on there. I'm like, oh, this is interesting, you know, and now he's just. Now he's just a cartoon character. You doing this stuff, but I still, I still, yeah. it's still entertaining to me, and it, that's all it is is entertainment. Here's what I've realized, and and uh, Doug and I talked about this. I wish there was a way to take straight ticket. Is that what they call it? Voting yeah, straight ticket off because yeah. I don't care sure. the fact that someone has an R or a D beside their name. You can't tell me there's every Demo there's not one Democrat that has good intentions. You 100%. can't tell me there's not one Republican. That has 100%. good intentions, but 100%. you also can't tell me there's some in there that are absolutely full of shit either. <laughs> right. Right. You know what I mean? I had a buddy who was running. He was, a um, he was running and he was super Republican and he asked me for my vote. And I said, <clears throat> okay. And I, I actually videotaped me filling in his little thing. And then uh, the other side, I filled in everybody else, the Democrats, you know, mm -hmm. but I had him there and he said, and I, I mailed it, I put it in, and he said, you realize that that's, that's going to be dismissed now. <laughs> like You blew it. You can't, you can't do what you just did. I'm like, oh, my God, now none of my votes count. Oh, you but can't anyway. film yourself voting. I didn't know that. No, he was saying, I think he was saying you, can't, you couldn't vote. You couldn't vote on both sides Oh, on this particular ballot. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That doesn't, is that a Michigan thing? Is he in Michigan? He's in Michigan, yeah. Huh. So. No, I've never heard of that. Well, I have a good friend uh, who ran for governor last year. He's been on my podcast. His name's Ben Salengo. Uh, he's a local attorney who hired me years ago to perform at some events for him. Because uh, something a little bit about me, I'm a professional turntable DJ, so I mix and scratch and cut. Oh, nice. so if you ever need a DJ at a show local to pump up the crowd, I'm your guy. I but um, we became good friends, and he actually became my attorney for my business when I started my business. And uh, he ran and became the Democratic nominee uh, gubernatorial is that how you say it gubernatorial, gubernatorial nominee yeah uh for the state of west virginia in 2020 
And uh, I thought he had a really close chance of winning. But I voted for him. He's a Democrat. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't fill that little square in fast enough. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, if and, everybody and, treated yeah. it that way, then, you know, I think we I think the government would be run smoother <laughs> if we didn't worry so much about. I had an idea years ago that I floated out in a blog, which was here's what we should do. We should let the Democrats be in control for six years. And then the Republicans are in control for six years. And then the Democrats are because it's all it all goes back and forth. Every the pendulum. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Why not just do that? Automatically, they're in charge, you know. Like, you know, and, and there's so much debate now over Ukraine. That seems to be the big hot right. topic. Uh, in your years of touring, and, and er, did you ever make it to the Ukraine? Did not. Um, we went to, I mean, all over Europe. We were in Czechoslovakia. Uh, you know, that's probably the farthest um, I would say the, um, mm -hmm. the farthest that we had gone, you know, never been to Russia or any of the, you know, any of the things that any of the places that Billy Joel had gone to put it that way. <laughs> uh, so no, never had been there. Never been there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sad, you know, and it, 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 it me and a friend were talking yesterday, you know, of course you, you want to help those people. Sure. Um, but also, and I'm sure you could say this for Michigan, I can see people and families right around West Virginia that could really use that help too. So 100%. it's like, what do we do? You know, it's really difficult. I'm right now. I'm working with the indigenous people to get them fed. We're trying to feed 300,000 meals to the indigenous. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I mean that's that to me is more important right now. And I, I can say, listen, I'm not dismissing the Ukraine, but my focus, my individual focus, is on getting these 300,000 meals to the indigenous people in Michigan. That to me is what I'm thinking about. And I think, you know, I think when you get into the debate where, where the money should go, listen, I mean, we are a nation of philanthropists or we, we at least should be, I think Na yeah. uh, we should help those. I mean, we're number one nation in the world. We should be doing good, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and not just focusing on our own, but that being said, when I see a lo an issue locally, I want to help. I want to get my hands dirty. I want to physically be there to get my hands dirty. And I want to hear more about this. Thing. What 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 is this project you're working on to feed these folks? I want to hear well, more about it. It's called it's called Aquane. I work with a uh, a Native American minister who happens to be a Christian, which is an anomaly in its own. Uh, but uh, we had worked with someone who had frauded them. Unfortunately, and I was involved in that, and I was cleared of any wrongdoing. Thank goodness. But he had promised three hundred thousand meals to these tribes, and turns out it was all a big fraud. So now this mm. minister and I got together and we said, "Listen, we have to least get the people fed that were promised the food." And right now we're about halfway there to our goal. So that's that's how I got involved in it, and I'll keep I'll keep doing it too because. Most people, and I'll make it really brief. I'm not going to get in a soapbox. Most people no, think sure. that most Take people think that the Native Americans are on the on the government's teat all the time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They think that they're on reservations. Seventy five percent of Native Americans are not on reservations. They're urban. They're poor. You know, they don't get the the benefits from the casinos. Most casinos lose money or just make enough money to pay. Uh, their employees and everything too. So there's not a lot of extra money that goes around, and these kids are starving. I mean, the kids and the oh, old, they're all starving. So it's it's a really sad state of affairs, but that's where I'm putting all my focus in. So again, when we talk about the Ukraine and why people might not be as interested, I'm definitely interested. I just know that here I can do some good. I'm not sure I can do any good talking about worrying about the Ukraine. You know what I sure. mean? So, now, if we want to help, if someone wants to help your effort in feeding these tribes, where could we find that? Oh and I'll put I'll put that that information in the show notes too, so people can click the link. That's amazing. Yeah, it's go to go to our Facebook page, which is Aquane. It's A Q U E N E, uh, and they'll get more information right there. And That's they can awesome, also right? anybody can write me there too, and and uh, reach out to me either uh, as well. How how much it, does it take to uh, feed, say, a family? with this program one meal for instance there are two meals there's a meal of it's it's oat, it's an oatmeal it's uh apples and cinnamon oatmeal or whatever each package is a package of uh it feeds six 
So, and each package only costs us $2 to produce. Uh, so you're feeding, you know, a family of six for $2. And it's, I mean, it's, our system is worked out where that $2 includes the semi trucks that take it up there, the packaging, all of those things. So it's a, it's a fantastic program. Well, I tell you what, when we get off here and hang up, I'm going to make a donation from the Nick Scott effect, help you guys out a little bit. Really nice. And, uh, I don't, I don't like to brag about what I help stuff, but I'm going to help. I'll pitch in. Uh, you know, I, I have two little ones and I grew up, my dad was a preacher growing up. Yep. Uh, so I might be confusing. I talked about my dad, the chef. Uh, I have a yeah. stepdad and a dad. They're both huge. They're both huge pillars of my life. They're both extremely important. And I call them both dad because yeah. they both were, sure. they're both equally responsible for how I turned out. Sure. Uh, my stepdad, who I called dad was a preacher and we grew up pretty poor. I mean, mm-hmm. he didn't make a lot of money. And and I remember what that was like growing up in a single white trailer. You know, our clothes were hand-me-downs. We got our food from the church given mm-hmm. to us. We were uh, on government assistance at one point when I was in high school. I remember what that was like. And I, I remember hearing the conversations of them when I was in my room. They didn't think I could hear them, but mm-hmm. I could hear the worry in right. the other room. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So whenever I have that opportunity now to to help, you know, uh, 13 year old Nick. I remember that. And yeah. I'm like, Hey man, whatever I can do to help out. Love Absolutely. It. Love it, yeah. man. Love that. Well, thank so you. For that. I, can you spell it one more time? So we get it right. Yep. A Q U E N E. That's awesome, man. That is incredible. Well, I've had you on here for almost an hour. I talk to you all day long, but I know you're in the studio. I feel like I'm taking your time up. I don't want to take you away from the studio. Yeah. They probably, they're probably ruining my songs right now in there. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hey, do this it, and this. You know. Would it be possible when the record's finished and you guys are ready to release a song? Yeah. Could I have you back on and maybe we can premiere new music from the Verve Pipe? 100%. You'd be the first call, dude, for real. Just get with Doug, for sure. I'd love to. Brian, man, I have been a fan for years. This is a, a pretty cool moment for me, and I want to thank oh. you for allowing me to have that that this is awesome yeah nick this listen man you're you're great at this all great questions and a conversation flow that's the way podcasts need to be bro thank you so much brother and is it before we uh end this is there any other things you would like to tell folks either to go check out your music your tour dates anything no i mean listen you know i think if people do tiktok some people are worried about tiktok it happens to be my favorite platform i have so much fun on there go to my tiktok Go to the Verb Pipe TikTok because I also have this ongoing fake feud with Rob Thomas that's pretty funny right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, Are you uh, friends and, with him in real life? I've been friends with him for years, although we haven't we have we were disconnected there for the last probably the last 10 years, but every once in a while we'll go back and forth. I don't even think he knows there's a fake feud going on, but I'm having a blast with it. Every other <laughs> thing is the Every other thing is like, oh, fucking Rob Thomas again, you know, that kind of thing. You know? <laughs> anyway, it's a lot of fun. So people will enjoy the TikTok or all our social media. So it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Cool. All right, Brian. Thank you so much, Thanks, dude. Nick.